Hello and welcome to the Olympic city of Innsbruck in Austria. 1964 and 1976, it was the Olympic host city. And above the city in the Tyrol Mountains, we are at the tiny village of Eagles. It's here that the ice sliding sports took place. Well, hello everybody, I'm Martin Haven, getting ready for the first eat of the two-man bobsled. I'm delighted once more to be joined in the booth by Team USA's Kurt Tomasiewicz. Kurt, sitting out the two-man race, you'll be racing in the four-man. And part of your job, especially on this track, is to give your driver the best start because that's a big equation here. Yeah, on this track, more than probably any other track, the start is critical. Uh, it's not a real steep start. We're going to see push times that may break five seconds. You can see the start record there is 4.96. Uh, but the start is critical because it really doesn't drop off too quickly. You need that, that quick start to keep you going through this first little kink, curve one and curve two. Again, this is a long kind of flat section right here. Curve three isn't really exciting either, just kind of a big swooping left curve. And then you come into the first labyrinth. And you're starting to pick up a little bit of speed here. Four, five, and curve six here, a little right, which will set you up hopefully for Kreisel. Now, Kreisel is a almost 270 degree curve. It kind of, the track goes underneath itself here, right before curve eight. Definitely curve nine is going to be a critical curve before a little straightaway because that will set you up well into curve 10. A wide open curve. And this will set you up for the second labyrinth, curves 11, 12, and 13. And the final curve, a big left hand curve, curve 14. And the braking stretch is pretty quick here for, for the, uh, the brakeman. He needs to pull those brakes early because it's a, it's a short braking stretch, actually. And if you don't do a, a great job pulling those brakes, you could damage your runners. And shoot through the station right past the finish area. Stephen Holcomb is our World Cup points leader in two-man still. Slew of success has prepared Hefty in the last couple of race weekends. Have brought him into close contact in second ahead of Alexander Zubkov of Russia. Junior world champion and senior world champion Francesco Friedrich lies in fourth in the World Cup standings. And this year, the World Cup standings have an added meaning, Kurt, because they will also decide potentially who goes to the Winter Games and who doesn't, and in what start position they will start that competition, because that's all based on the FIBT's rankings. Definitely, you know, you, the, the sleds that are ranked probably 20 through 30, you know, they're fighting for rank to, to qualify for the Olympics, where the sleds that are a little bit higher than that are fighting for a start position at the Olympics. They want that fresh ice going off the track in Sochi. <laughs> Well, you can see everybody getting warmed up and ready for the start. And in our start list, there have been a couple of changes. Nikolai Strate of Romania was due to start in the race in 19th position. I understand he is not going to take the start today. And I understand as well that the second of our Italian sliders, Lucas Schnitzer, who is due to start in 24th spot, will also not be at the start. Now, Estrate, right on the bubble of earning himself a two-man spot in Sochi. So uh, that is not really a race he wants to miss. After this weekend, all points will be sealed and all positions will be decided. First led on the ice, 50 years nearly after the 1964 Winter Olympic Games. We are back in Eagles in Austria. And Stephen Holcomb, the four-man Olympic champion, gets this two-man race underway. It's hard to imagine Steve and Steve not having a great start time in this track. They really gelled well together and have had a, a great success so far this season. 5.08 start time, pretty good start to the day. Well, Holcomb and Langton, a big crew, fast starting crew, and that momentum is vital. These slow early corners, any skid here, Kurt Tomasiewicz, is going to just be like putting the brakes on. Yep, driving less is obviously better. Less is more here. You want to just barely get around those curves without causing a skid without steering too much. 90 kilometers an hour, 56 miles an hour, and accelerating hard now here, down through the Chrysler and below the speed, really picking up, gets it nicely out of corner nine. A little bit of wiggle with the runners there to keep it straight, does a good job, doesn't hit any walls very hard. 24.6 is 77 and a half miles an hour and still accelerating to line. And that is a nice run. That's wow. a very nice run indeed. 51.78, a new track record for Steve Holcomb. Now, the start is in the same place as it's always been. The finish line has been moved by a few metres this season. And so uh, 
It was a young Austrian who set that track record uh, early in January this year. Yeah, the start was terrific. A 5.08 start time, they got to be pretty happy with that. You can see his hands come nice and smooth right through there, kind of his arms come aloft and enters the sled nice and smooth, and that, that'll set you up for great start velocity. This super slow makes it look so balletic when they feed these big bodies, wide shoulders into this narrow bathtub. Hockey looks pretty happy with that, I'd say. Yeah, definitely. You know, we said it's a track record, but at the same time, we have to remember that they have moved the start, or the, excuse me, the finish line uh, up 11 meters. It's coming out of that final stretch. So it could be a little deceiving that that was a track record. Second sled then, Thomas Florschutz of Germany with Kevin Kuska, the man mountain behind him. And oh, did Florschutz stumble there or did I not see that correctly? Looked like it may not have been the best getaway from the driver. Well, Kevin likes to really pick that sled up when he hits it. I mean, he's a huge human being, you know, he's really tall. So for him to hit that sled and his initial movement with that sled down around his knees, it tends to come up a little bit. And that can look a little awkward. A 5.13 start time. What's funny is they push a 5.18 and a 5.19 in practice. So that's not a huge difference between practice and a race. Normally you'll find the teams are a little bit more eager to get on the ice in the race, a little bit more pumped, a little bit quicker. Good lines from floor shoots, though. That was neat and tidy. What's the front? Yeah, what's the front tips of the runners? Oh, gets a little run down the straight. Tiny tap, 102.6 to 103.8 at Holcomb. It's not going to leave him close to the lead. 124 kilometers an hour coming into curve 10. Whipping Excuse past me, our the, the final curve. Yeah, whipping past our cameras at 75 miles an hour and change. 52-19. Christoph Lang and the coach not exactly looking overjoyed with that. We need to take a look again at the driver at the start. <laughs> Kuska looks like he's yeah. wearing this thing. Yeah, you can see the start here. Kevin always picks that sled up, and this time it comes way left, comes out of the grooves there for about his first three or four steps. And it's just hard for him to, to push that sled when it's so low down there. Yeah. Here's the exit of curve nine, where Holcomb did a little bit of driving to keep the sled straight. Florsius decides to take a little bit of a tap on the left side of his, uh, of his sled. Set him up nicely for corner 10. But velocity at the start means velocity at the bottom here. It's such a short, just over 1,200 meters this track. Yeah, Florsius doesn't look exactly happy with that. Man Mountain, Kevin Kuska behind him. Well, if the start record is going to go, it may be this man, in fact, these two men who own the start record that are going to break it. 496, they said it December 2011. So it's two seasons old now. The track conditions were excellent when he broke that start record. I don't think it's going to go down today. 501, still a great start. Seven hundredths of a second ahead of Holcomb in the first 50 meters, but it's going to take a great drive for him to keep that velocity. Well, my Bardis, there's no question he's got the horsepower, but it's controlling it and repeating it, and that's what's going to take time to come. Yep, he has moments where he's, he's shown great driving and he's able to keep that speed, but today's not today. He's already 100th back. He lost 800s in that one split. That's a third of the way down the track, which means he could be up to two tenths and more behind Holcomb. Ooh, but that was a good exit out of nine. Threatens the wall a little high in ten. Doesn't pop off. That's good. He's got good speed as well. 123.9 is very close. Let's see how close he can be at the bottom. Will he be ahead of floor shots? He is. 3,200 is back, though. That leaves a big chasm, and there's lots of room for other sleds to improve. Yeah, I would have guessed Mel Bartis and floor shoots would have been two of the favorites coming into this race. So for Holcomb to be ahead of both of those guys by you know, a third of a second, that's a great sign for the Americans so far. Well, it's a warm afternoon. Temperature is plus five or six. You know, we talked about how Kevin Kuske is a big human being. Dryskin's in the back of that sled, too. He's just a, a beast, and he can really power that sled. You can see his hamstrings working there. Uh, I think this is the lower labyrinth here. He had a, a little bit of problem in the middle section, and that's where he lost most of his time. He had good speed at the bottom, but somewhere in the middle, he made a few mistakes. Damas Dreiskins on the left, and on the right with his new short haircut, Oscars Melbarnis. Now from Canada, Lyndon Rush with Lascelles Brown. And Lyndon Rush finally starting to hit his stride in the last couple of race weekends of the season. Lascelles had an excellent push last week in St. Moritz, Switzerland. It really uh, surprised a lot of people that, uh, you know, a guy of, of his age, honestly, could still push that great. He, he always seems to rise to the occasion. 5.13 start time ties the Germans. 
Former Jamaican, of course, slid for Canada, then for Monaco, and back to Canada. And such a high knee action when he's sprinting. I mean, it's a real sprinter style, but the power that he produces is exceptional. Yeah, despite his good start time, he didn't quite have the start velocity that some of the other teams had so far. And uh, he's starting to fall back a little bit here because of that. Just a whisker behind Kevin uh, uh, Florshut, Kuska. Oh, and that is uncomfortable exit. Yeah, takes that last kiss off that wall and sets him up pretty rough for curve 10. 122.5, two kilometers an hour down. So this is going to leave him probably in fifth spot, fourth spot rather at the moment. And 52.5, uh, that's seven tenths of a second behind the race leader. And, well, that again is starting to put Holke's run into perspective. That's an impressive start and an impressive drive from our four-man Olympic champion. When he hits that sled here, you can see his left hand rotates just a little bit before his right hand. You know, it's not a fatal mistake, but sometimes you really want to pull that sled at the same time, get it through, so you get your upper body in a nice position to, to power the sled in a, in a solid one unit comfortable position. You can see here the exit of curve nine, very late into there, and that sends him immediately into the wall, takes the tap to set him up to, for curve 10. He had to drive it down off the corner, it would have rolled on him, and hits it on the inside wall. There's Lascelles Brown, and here is Corey Butner with Charles Berkeley behind him. Corey Butner having a, a tough time in Europe in this second part of the season, but still lying fifth in the World Cup rankings in the two-man. Which yeah, is definitely working a lot better for him. Yeah, we expect big things out of Corey today in two-man. Tomorrow, is, you know, it's been a different story for him so far in the four-man races so far this season. But uh, today, I'm really hoping that he gets back on that podium, gets a top three finish here. Fifth in the World Cup ranking. Sam Moritz, 15th place, was his worst result of the season by some six spots. He's already had a couple of podium finishes in this two-man BMW sled. 5.14 start time. That's just 100th behind Kuske. Uh, as well as uh, the Canadian team, too, Lascelles Brown. So uh, that's a pretty decent start time for Chucky Corey there. Yeah. 102 kilometers an hour. That is decent speed as well. Quicker than the Canadians. 123.8, very close. Only two sleds have been faster. He's closing the gap a little. And he moves into fourth position ahead of Lyndon Rush of Canada. 300 is back. Exactly. He's, he's right in the mix Kuska. there. It's going to be close when it comes time to hand out the medals. So Florschutz and Kuska started 100th quicker. And they're 300 apart at the bottom. That's going to be an entertaining second heat. A couple mistakes here. You can see him coming into Kreisel, maybe driving a little bit too hard because when he comes out of Kreisel, the exit right here, a big skid right there. You can see the sled going almost sideways for a long distance as well. He needs to get that sled pointed straight. That's the most aerodynamic way to, to drive that sled. Oh, that was uncomfortable exit there as well. Looked like the corners were just coming exit at him faster than he was expecting. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you see the Chrysler, he said? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for a mistake like that to be in fourth position right now, I know we've only had five sleds go down, but uh, he's going to be in good shape going into the second heat. Stephen Holcomb is our race leader. Chris Spring of Canada next up with Jesse Lumsden behind him. And Chris Spring just a fraction behind, 16 points behind teammate Lyndon Rush in the two-man rankings. He's the top Canadian four-man pilot this season as well. 5-0-7, and that's all part of the equation. Another epic start from these two. Yeah. We've seen uh, good start times and good start velocities from Jesse Lumpson. He's a beast behind that sled. You know, every week we talk about how good of an athlete he is. A world push champion from the beginning of the season. Although he's falling back now, Chris must have made a, a little bit of a mistake somewhere between curves three, four, and five. A little bit like Winterberg, it's the slow stuff that really kills your speed. Apparently he made a bigger mistake than I thought. He's really falling back now. He's going to be about 2,500, I'm guessing, here at this next split behind. We may see as the race continues that sleds are struggling to meet the pace of the first guys on the ice who had the freshest, coldest, hardest ice. Now that's, it's going to be a really close race here in the second. He, he split the difference between Butner and Floorshoots. 
There's 300 difference between third, fourth, and fifth place right now. Yeah. Now we expect to see a lot of that. In the uh, skeleton race earlier, we had no less than seven athletes tied in the top 20. And I think this is the exit of Kreisler right here. He's on a little bit longer. Excuse me, curve nine. Coming out of there, he's on a lot longer than what the other sleds we've seen. His runners are still way up on that ice. Flops down pretty hard and has to take that tap on the left. And of course, the big steering in the corner also slows you down. You can see the runners cutting the ice. There is Chris Spring. And at the top of the track is Francesco Friedrich of Germany. He is our four-man world champion and our two-man junior world champion from last season. He also won the junior two-man world championship title as well. You know, we keep talking about the big guys in the back of the sled. Huben Baker is still a taller athlete yet. 5'11 start time, fourth fastest we've seen so far. Right here, 50.7. We've seen 50.8 and 50.9 so far. So they're a little bit slower coming into curves 2, 3. And through the labyrinth. Well, apart from the first speed trap, Stephen Holcomb has been the quickest man on the ice everywhere so far. That's why he's our race leader. Last week in Samaritz, wherever you started in the field, probably didn't have a massive advantage or deficit. Way high there, but he nails the exit. Really uh, what's that doing to his speed? That's very good. Great exit out of curve nine. You can see how the last few sleds that we saw had to take a tap on the left side. Friedrich nailed that. Uh, straight as an arrow, right through the straightaway. A bit of a shrug from Alex Mann, but uh, Christoph Lang and the coach quite like that. Second spot for them. 2800s back, 400s in front of Oscars Melbardis. He's a Turner there, helping with the sled dogging. You see how high they get in curve 10. You know, they're treating it almost like horseshoe that we saw last week in St. Moritz, getting close to the, the peak of there. A lot of height, of course, it is great for uh, potential energy. You know, it can drop down, have a lot of momentum going into that, but if you can't control it, then, uh, then it's not worth it. But uh, Friedrich definitely controlled that height there. Yeah, he had that worked out properly, didn't he? Francesco Friedrich lies in second to Stephen Holcomb. Oscar Melbardis is in third. Well, here's a third of our US sleds, all of them in the top eight start draw. And the fresher the ice you get here in Eagles this afternoon, the better it will be. Concert pianist Andreas Tribal behind Nick Cunningham. Yeah, these two haven't slid together yet this year, uh, just this week during practice. Andreas usually on Corey's four-man sled, so these two are going to pair up this week. We'll see how they can do. Well, the thing for brakemen, Kurt Tomasevich, is that you can cycle them around because you have enough for a four-man sled, which means you can use different guys, different weeks in the two-man. So that has two benefits. First, you learn who works well with other drivers, and secondly, you keep them fresh. The problem is the drivers have to push every start. That's exactly true. And, you know, this week for the Americans, you know, our strategy is to try to really do well in the four-man race tomorrow. You know, right now we only have two sleds qualified. We'd like to qualify three. So rotating these push athletes around gives us a good chance of doing well tomorrow in the four-man race. Cunningham off a 5.15 start. Currently an eighth spot. Just a whisker behind Lyndon Rush of Canada. Long skid there will take away a tenth. 1018. Same speed as Rush. And just like Friedrich, he had a lot of height in curve 10 and was still able to control it. So that's a good sign. But uh, 75 hundredths of a second back. Just a little bit behind Lyndon Rush, though. 5253 slide. Leaves him 300s behind Rush. That could well be enough for a top 10 run in the first heat. You know, Nick, a part of the Army, U.S. Army Reserve, and so that uh, you know could give him a little bit of background to keep him very disciplined coming through some of these curves. You know, it takes a lot of concentration. This is just before Kreisel, curve six into Kreisel. A little height at the beginning. Controls it for the most part, but the exit out of Kreisel sent him very much on the right side. But still kept the sled straight, not so bad. So it is the USA that lead with Stephen Holcomb as we get to Alexander Zukov of Russia. Now for the last two or three weeks, he's had Alexei Vyavoda behind him. Vyavoda being rested this weekend in the two-man. Dmitry Trunenkov, who has been one of his stalwarts for the last couple of seasons, is behind him. 
So Kov's daughter's birthday was yesterday. She is sliding skeleton in Europa Cup in Königsee, Bavaria. Yeah, we've talked a little trouble getting into the sled there for Zubkov. 5.14 start time, not a great start time. But he had control of the sled going into the first corner, and that is the critical issue. Not bad velocity, although this velocity seems to clump a lot of sleds together, 50.6 through 50.9. So it's uh, not a lot of difference in velocity coming out of curve one. That's over 31 miles an hour from a 60-meter running push. Just think about the acceleration in that. Zubkov had some awesome downtimes in training this week. He's 2,200 of a second back, but uh, he's got a great trip. He's got some good speed. He could oh. reel that in a little bit. Second man into 103's only race leader, Stephen Holcomb, got up to there. 125 kilometers an hour, fastest of all with the Valner sled. Austrian company, Austrian track, and he drives himself into second place. <laughs> wow, he's a quarter of a second back from Stephen Holcomb. We're not arguing about the 100th, but that was a good trip down the ice. Yeah, he's got to be pretty happy with that. You know, if he can drop his start time, his start time was a rank of seventh. His splits then went from seventh to fifth to fourth to second. So the whole way down the track, he was gaining on Holcomb. You can see when he loaded into the sled here, everything looks okay when he puts his feet in, but he must have caught his feet on his D-rings, his driving mechanism, and uh, couldn't quite load into the sled all the way. Had to hold himself upright here for a little bit. He's got to get his foot unentangled, because if he just pushes, it'll steer the sled hard right into the wall. Yep. Luckily, he was still in the grooves when all that was taking place, so the, the directing the runners in a different way wasn't going to affect him. OK, Bert Hefty of Switzerland with behind him, Thomas Amrine. Let's see now if that start record oh, oh, yeah. is going to go. You know, if Pete was using Alex Bauman or uh, Thomas Lamparder, I would say they'd have a close shot at that start record. But uh, 508 start time today, he's not using his best brakeman in Thomas. Well, again, the focus of everybody all year long is going to be on two weeks in Russia in February. So you will take whatever comes along the way. But what you want, Kurt, is to get to Russia in the best state of your career, physically, mentally, and everything else. Exactly. He tied Holcomb at the start there and had a little bit better velocity, so he went green for a split second, but uh, uh, maybe not as good of the lines Speed down the track, I guess. Zubkov, Zubkov, 103, one here. Hefty is 103 flat. This is going to be very close for second spot. Compared Hefty. Close on race leader Stephen Holcomb. 124.3 means he'll probably be third at the line, but by how much? Ooh, second by 200 ahead of Zubkov. Well, Holcomb is still that step ahead. But everybody else, wow, they've got their hands around each other's throats. Yeah, it's going to be a great race for second place so far and a great race for about fifth place. Uh, Holcomb's got a great lead right now, and maybe you can attribute some of that to being first off the hill because beat. Looked like he had a pretty good run here. You can see coming out of curve nine. Does take a little tap on the left, but that sets him up really well for curve 10 to try to get some height. Well, Hefty had great starts last year to win on this track. Fastest start helps. Stephen Holcomb hasn't had the fastest start, but boy, has he had a trip down here to lead after the first 10 of our 26 legs. Well, Kurt, the question as you get from the warmth of the afternoon towards the cool of the evening, the sun's already dropped, the mountains are now starting to be almost in shadow across the valley from us, is what will happen to the track? It clearly doesn't seem to be getting any quicker now, but in the second heat an hour or so from now, that might be the case. And Holcomb, having had great ice to start with, might end up with the best ice. Of course, yep. he might end up with the worst ice. Exactly. All night, the temperature is going to drop, but that doesn't mean that the the harder ice is going to make for better track conditions. You know, as the sleds go down, you know, several hundred pounds are going to deteriorate that ice, break it up a little bit, and uh, these next few sleds, it's going to be hard for them to crack into the top ten. Well, of course, the big call for those later down in the start draw, if you're sort of 16th, 17th or below in the 26 or 24 sleds, whoever actually turn up, the, the problem then is going to be you'll have a slower track and you're trying to beat guys that went earlier who have gone quicker and make it into the race because only the fast 20 will go through. There is Bert Hefty, and you can see 
Just what a glamorous sport it is. You hump your own sleds on and off lorries, on in and out of vans. You do all the lifting, the carrying, polishing the runners to mirror perfection. It's a very dirty, gritty sport. It's not quite as glamorous as people imagine it might be. Yeah, there's a lot that we do. The evolution of the sport is really taking the equipment to another level, but uh, at the same time, all the athletes really continue to do the grunt work. Yeah, it's, it's real infantry work <laughs> down at ground level. And uh, you get the little glamour every year of going to Samaritz. Beyond that, there you all can about see. grinding it out. Yep, beat Hefty, ranks second in the world as a driver, carrying his own sled to put it onto the scale. Yeah, there's no millionaire drivers in this sport. You should have got into Formula One if you wanted that. <laughs> The Olympic track at Innsbruck in Austria. We're in the small village of Eagles. Uh, we have 10 of our 26 sled entry down in the first heat. Round seven of the Wiesmann FIBT two-man bobsleigh World Cup. Martin Haven and US athlete Kurt Tomasiewicz calling the action as Max Arndt and the giant Marco Hubenbecker push off for Germany. Yeah, I was mistaken earlier. I said Hubenbecker was pushing for Friedrich, but that was Giannis Becker. Both just, just massive men that try to get into that two-man sled. You know, it's a tight fit for them. And uh, a 5.26 start time. That's really not a great start time for this. Only 50 kilometers an hour. That's the slowest sled we've seen in the first 50 meters. Only 31 miles an hour, as we're saying. <laughs> it is still rapid acceleration. You have to be quick just to stay with the sled and jump in. 89.1 kilometers an hour, and again, as we've seen from the last few sleds, there is still speed if you get everything nailed together perfectly, but joining the dots here is not easy. Yeah, exactly. You know, on this track, you can lose time, but you're not going to make up time. You can't drive your way, really, to, to putting, giving yourself a medal. You've got to have a great start time to keep that velocity at least through Kreisel, which is curve seven. Well, ninth fastest run for him, 52.43. Leaves him halfway between Corey Butner and Lyndon Brush. About four or five hundreds between each of those three sleds. And Max Arndt definitely known more for his uh, success in four-man. But, uh, you know, driving the two-man is a learning process for four-man, too. You know, that he can learn from some of his sakes, mistakes that he makes today and apply it tomorrow because we know he's going to be a threat tomorrow for the medals. Reigning four-man world champion. Germany had both bobsled world champions last year. With young Francesco Friedrich taking the two-man title and Max Arndt the four-man title. Well, next up is Team Beard, or at least half of it. Justin Cripps with Brian Barnett behind him, a newcomer to the Canadian Olympic setup this year. And Kurt, what about Barnett? You, you've got to be some athlete to go straight into the team from, you know, a, a tryout camp, right? Exactly, and especially in Olympic gear. And it's very rare that an athlete can try out for the sport and make the Olympics within one year. You know, this may be one of the only Olympic sports where you could do that. It just takes uh, pure athleticism, and, and Brian appears to have that. One thing I don't think they told him when he signed up for tryouts is that he was going to have to grow a Duck Dynasty beard. But uh, <laughs> that's the way that the Crips team is rocking it this year. 506 start time. Yeah, that attributes yeah. to Bryant's great athleticism. But well, it's a, a little the way Kay, uh, Chelsea Valois came onto Kaylee Humphrey sled last year. She came out late after all the other trials had been done. She couldn't make the regular trials. Came in and just started ripping start records apart in Calgary. And they went, OK. Come talk to us, sit down, we need to have a word about you. Exactly, you know, pushing with Kaylee doesn't exactly make your numbers look bad either, but no. uh, no, uh, Justin, else? having a little trouble keeping that yeah. great start time that he had is starting to fall back a little bit. Just 1600s behind, this could be top five or six at the bottom if he keeps it tidy through the lower labyrinth, 123.1. Is he gonna be in sixth position at the line? This could put him as our top Canadian sled. It does put him as our top Canadian sled. And for coaches here like Graham Richardson and Tom Delahunty, having three Canadian sleds, each of one, you know, week in, week out, one of, the, one of them is vaulting the other two. That just builds such great competition within the team. Without a doubt, competition breeds success. You know, these guys are, you know, very friendly with each other, but at the same time, you know, they, they really want to beat each other. You know, they want to be the best on the hill, be the best Canadian for that day. Well, you can't be the champion unless you beat your own teammates as well as everybody else, and, and that's the deal. And, uh, you know, Justin really helps pushing on that driver's bar. He pushed for Pierre Luters for the Canadian team in 2010. 
and uh, you know just a great push athlete in in, in that. Talking to Pierre down at the uh, Chrysal. I said, where? How do you tie it? Ooh, look at that bump! Didn't see that in the first run. Yep between curves 12 and 13, uh, a little rough transition. That's about as close to crashing as, uh, as most teams will get is down between curves 12 and 13. And still sixth fastest. Next up, Alexander Kazyanov of Russia with Max Belugin. Well, 5.21, that's the least speedy. Oh, no. Marco Hoopbecker and Max Arndt went away in 5.26, so not another strong getaway. Yeah, Kazanov not really known for uh, being part of great pushing combinations, but uh, seems to have a lot of success, again, especially in four-man. Two-man, not bad, but, uh, you know, he's not ranked in the top ten. Kazanov off half a second back already. This is going to leave him at least a second adrift at the bottom of the track. Not really what the Russians want from their number two man. Really slow speed, 101.7 kilometers an hour right there. I don't really want to say this, but he might struggle to stay in the top 20 at the end of the run. 0.89 back, not quite the second that I'd anticipated. That is a long way adrift. Right now in last place. Yeah, Alexander Zubkov was 6,500 quicker than Alexander Kazyanov. And the youngster should be closer to his team leader than that. Yeah, you know, sometimes in two-man you can uh, have a frustrating day, take a breath and a scream, and you know you can line up again for the four-man the next day and have another shot. Nice smooth load getting into the sled, but just not enough power behind it. Yeah, 521 getaway, leaving him with a lot of work to do in a very short distance down this track. So it's still Stephen Hall compared hefty Alexander Zubkov, your top three. Second of our Swiss sleds this week as they change up and change down is Rika Peter with Jörg Egger behind him. Our former colleague on the brakes with Ben Hefty, used to push Martin Allen and Ivo Rug, and is still, like Thomas Lampart, a part of this Swiss setup. Jörg doesn't do a whole lot of two-man pushing. You can see a lot of teams, they prepare for this race in different ways. Some of them have their their uh, Olympic team selected and qualified, and so they're using this to, to maybe rest some athletes. Some are fighting for that spot, so uh, changing brakeman is pretty common in this seventh race of the year. And you saw how expertly Jörg Egger just vanished from sight. His head bubbling up and down behind Rico Pedro, and then suddenly he wasn't there anymore. Just yeah. totally disappeared into the sled. Yeah, Jörg's a beast, but it's from the waist down. He's not a real tall guy, but he's got a you know huge quads, hamstrings, and thighs. Great loads, keeps the momentum alive, but what can Rico Peter do here? Only 28 hundredths of a second now, that's not so bad so far. Coming between curve nine and into 10. A little lower than some of the sleds we've seen. Ninth place on the splits, 123.8. Good speed from the distinctive Swiss CTA sled. And 10th place at the bottom. Well, after seeing Alexander Kazyanov flounder on his run, I wondered whether there was still speed in the track. Apparently, yes, there is, if you drive it straight. I was just going to mention that. You know, we expect the ice to be getting worse and worse as the sun starts to set, and a lot of sleds come down this hill, but Rico Peter kind of proved that wrong. He had a pretty decent run for him. Can we talk about Jurg in the back of that sled? And you can see his head bobbing down, bobbing up and down. Jumps into the sled and disappears pretty quickly. It's interesting, there's no gloves worn by Yurik. Usually push athletes like to uh, wear some gloves so they can you know, grip that sled a little bit better. Yeah. Rico. And here is Simone Batazzo with Francesco Costa behind him. He's number one two-man brake man. So Patazzo clearly looking for points and positions. This is his favorite discipline, the two-man over the four-man. Yeah, Simone has had a lot of success in two-man. You know, he's won a uh, race or two in, in Lake Placid in the two-man competition. Hasn't had a whole lot of success so far this year. You know, he's ranked 14th in the world. Well, the problem with the two-man is the driver is 50% of the starting power. So he's four of your eight cylinders. And as you get older, that power kind of fades a little. Yep, I hate to say negative things about any other athlete, but, you know, he's 
his peak years might be behind him, as, at least as a pusher. You know, as a driver, he can continue to develop his skill and get better and better, but uh, he hasn't had the really good push times that the Italians used to. So still only 31 years old. He's won in late class and Torino in the two-man. He was ninth in the Torino games in two-man. It's definitely his favored weapon of choice, but 122.9, not got great speed down at the bottom from this Italian built and designed Conan sled. Yeah, made a few mistakes, really late out of the curve, excuse me, out of curve nine. And uh, that didn't help him as he came through the rest of the labyrinth and into the finish curve. Three hundredths of a second covering Lyndon Rush, Simone Batazzo and Nick Cunningham in that order, 12th, 13th and 14th places. So again, a very tight battle for the second heat. And this is that exit of curve nine, comes down a little early and that sends him up high late and that gets dangerous. You can almost tip a sled coming that late in curve nine, wow. And it comes down hard, you can see his helmet, well he actually controls his helmet pretty well. But uh, that, that's a mistake he just can't make and, and he should know better than that. He does, and unfortunately, still made the error. Stephen Holcomb, the race leader, by a significant margin from the chasing pack, closely bunched right behind him. 15 sleds down in what should be a 24 sled field, with second of our Latvians, Oskars Kibermanis. Virus Leibom's behind him. Virus, another relative newcomer to this Latvian squad, so again, that speaks volumes about how powerful he must be. Sled drifted to the right a little bit, but a 5.02 start time. That's a great start time, second only to oh, our Latvian teammates. Yep. Latvia one, yeah. 51 kilometers an hour, that's the fastest velocity we've seen so far. Well, that's Seven hundredths of a second ahead. It's going to be really hard for you know a young pilot to, to keep that velocity. He's probably going to fall behind him. Yep, there, the, the, the clock turns red on him. He's 300s back right now. Former decathlete, just 20 years old, Kiba Manis came in not as a brakeman but as a driver. And look at that, nailed that exit. 102.3 is good speed. Yeah, he's having a really good run. Quarter of a second back, you know, right now he's in fifth position. This could easily be a top six result. He could be, oh, he's fifth tied with his teammate to the hundredth of a second. The Latvians are tied together. That's really saying some for Keeper Bonas because yeah. you know, he's off way later in the order than, than his teammate uh, Mel Bartis is. So for them to be tied at the bottom, that's a, that's a pretty impressive drive for the young kid. Hundredth of a second apart at the top, nothing apart at the bottom. Great drive from a 20-year-old kid. That is sensational. No wonder he's smiling. Yeah, both these athletes, great push athletes. You know, Keeper Bonas just decided to do his pushing from the driver's bar and being controlled the rest of the way down the track. But uh, in reality, these are both good pushers. Yeah, just bulls. Lie bombs with his head almost below knee height as he was driving all that power forward. Loic Costeg of France with Roman Einrich behind him. And Loic with a, a borrowed sled last week in the four man competition. Had a disappointing time in Saint Moritz. This is the renaissance of French bobsledding here. You know, he's a young kid. He's got a little bit of growing up to do, and, uh, you know, you can't expect him to be really consistent going down the track every time. 5.25 start time. That's going to make it really tough for him to be competitive at the bottom. Well, the French team are basically starting from scratch again after retirement to Bruno Mijon nearly a decade ago. There was almost nothing. They have their own track in La Plagne, so that's a bonus, but you've got to get a team behind a driver. Absolutely. It takes three things to be successful, a driver, a pusher, and great equipment. And uh, right now they're trying to develop all three. That's, uh, that, that's starting from the back of the pack and trying to work your way up. That's not an easy thing to do. It's good to see the French team out, and they produce some entertaining results as well this season. Osteg really punching above his weight. 19th ranked in the World Cup points. Some much better known names. And a 16th fastest run, a 52-66, ahead of Alexander Kazyanov of Russia. Yeah. And that's not an unrespectable scout. No, that's uh, it's a little surprising for Kazyanov. Um, you know, one glimmer of, uh, of a good sign, I guess, for Kostik. Yeah. Well, these French guys may yet make the second heat. Again, here's that height and exit coming out of curve 10. Stays on that curve a long time. That's going to send him off to the left. He's probably going to take a little bit of a tap before he comes into the labyrinth, curve 11. 
Well, the thinking was right, but the execution wasn't quite on. And the there's that tap, that tap on the short wall as he exits the final corner. And look how much it bounces them up in the air as Roman Einerin gets on the brakes there as well. Yeah, a lot of teams will try to cut off that last bit of corner, and, and uh, you know, many pilots thinks that thinks many pilots, excuse me, think that is a, is a good sign, and it can maybe cut the distance off just a little bit. Ivo de Bruyne of the Netherlands with Dempster Wintersberger behind her, a friend of his from the Netherlands who's a, an ex-cycle racer who's now racing motorbikes. So the, perhaps the least likely uh, brakeman journey into the sport. That uh, inexperience might show there a little bit, uh, 540 start time, and uh, that's the, the slowest velocity we've seen so far at only 40 point, excuse me, 49.3 kilometers an hour. Well, Dem always says, he said, we're not going to have the fastest start. He's not a brakeman, he's not a sprinter, he knows that, but he's a friend of Evo, and Evo had no one on the back of the sled. And he said, at least it makes Debrun drive faster. Exactly. <laughs> Which is, it's a, you've got to put a positive spin on things if you can, and that's what they've done. 101.1, good smooth lines from De Bruyne. Evo, kilometers an hour. Evo is the best ranked Dutch box letter in two man, and I think still in four man. 53.29. Well, that puts him in the 18th spot at the moment. Yeah, that's six tenths of a second away from the next competitor. He's uh, quite a ways back. It's going to be really hard for him to, to make a second. Run. Well, they started three tenths of a second off the pace. Here's curve eight and into curve nine. That's a, this is a critical part of the track because curve nine into ten is a straightaway. And if you don't nail this exit out of curve nine, you're going to have a tough time. Already, he didn't have a whole lot of velocity, but uh, just causes him a few more problems as that sled is just a little bit sideways. A little bit of a skid, and the Dutch Bobsleigh Federation really need to get themselves sorted out. There's all sorts of trouble going on there. Well, no start for Nikolai Estrate of Romania, which may have a major problem for, for his participation in the games. Benny Meyer of Austria, 19 years old, is trying to book himself a place to go to the games for Austria. 5.20 getaway, as we said, Nikolai Strate not starting, and that may have a major impact on what happens to the Romanian entry for the two-man competition in Sochi. You know, normally you would think that uh, an Austrian sled on an Austrian track, they'd have a home track advantage, but you know, this track is honestly, it evens out that playing field because it's, in a lot of ways, such an easy track to drive that uh, there's really no home track advantage for the Austrians here. And he's just 19 years old, started in skeleton. His older brother, Raphael, still slides in skeleton. His younger brother, Sammy, who's 14, slides in skeleton. But his dad is the Austrian bobsled coach. One of them had to go and slide bobsled, I guess. It became his job. 13th fastest. The Austrians, Kurt, they have a secret shortcut down this track. They always produce the goods. You know, I just talked about how they may not have a uh, home track advantage here, but uh, I, I could be wrong. They might have a secret or two that they're hiding from the rest of the world. Well, I wonder if he will get to go to the Olympic Games. Not sure what the Austrian criterion are. Wolfgang Stamper should have been their lead driver, but he has quit the sport and gone off to be a ski coach. And here's that exit out of curve nine, I believe. And, uh, I've seen a lot of sleds have some trouble here. He's just a little bit sideways, but uh, that was a pretty good exit compared to most. I said Wolfgang Stamper, I meant Jürgen Lewacker, of course. Stamper's already quit after 2010 to coach. This, this young kid had a good trip down, little skid there. But he may be posting himself into an Olympic spot. 13th place, that's a really good run from a 19-year-old. Next up, Heath Spence of Australia with the stick behind him, Luki Mata. And these guys have spent most of their season competing in North America, World Cup and North America's Cup action. Now bringing their sleds over to the final couple of World Cup races here in Europe. You know, one other thing we talked, well, we did talk about how the temperature is going to drop when the sun sets, but, you know, when the sun sets, we're going to see some parts of the track that have a little bit more low light, and that could cause some problems for drivers. 
apart from anything else, it changes your perspective, doesn't it? Artificial light glares in a very different way off the track. Right up in the camion after the track walk at lunchtime with these guys. Chris Spring and Evo De Bruyne, and they said they were teaching Evo lines down the track. Of course, they then told him afterwards, we might not have taught you the right lines down the track. <laughs> 100.7 kilometers an hour, he's really trying to give the sled its head late on some of these exits just to hold the speed. And 19th place ahead of De Bruyne, but only by 300th of a second. That means anybody now who wants to make the race will have to probably jump both of them to get in. Yeah, I think it's going to be tough for both Spence and De Bruyne to get a second run there well off the pace. You know, right now we've only had 20 sleds go down and top 20 get a second run. Uh, you know, right here, just like the Germans, the Australian here, he picks up the sled pretty high. Um, it's, it's hard not to focus on the handprints right there running in front of it. <laughs> I think that's why they're there. Hello, girls. Uh, well, that, this is only his fifth trip down the track in a two-man this year, and only his second time ever on the track. Edwin van Kalk of the Netherlands, though, has got much more experience. We haven't got Yevgeny Pashkov of Russia. He is not sliding with Dmitry Stepushkin. So our field is reduced by a couple of sleds at least. Now, Van Kalka, by rights, should be top 10 or 12 in a four-man here, at least. Should be in the top 15 here in a two-man. But he needs, this is the final last gas salute, he needs a top eight finish to qualify for Dutch criterion in the four, in the two-man to go to the games. Yeah, I believe he's qualified in four-man, so that's not a problem for him. But I think he'd really like to do well here in two-man. He doesn't have his top breakman with him. Even Jansmar was injured in uh, Winterberg and looks like he will not compete again this season. You then have to think, well, in fact, will we ever see Sibren back on a bob track apart from as a fan? That's, that's tough to hear. Both guys are really nice. We'd like to see them do well, but right here he's not having a lot of success. Really, a lot of height early in curve 10, but controls it, controls it well going into the labyrinth. Well, 15th at the start. He's 14th place at the moment, so he should be in the second heat. He's 16th at the line, so he is in, and Ivo De Bruyne, his teammate, is out, and that will swap their positions in the World Cup rankings, I think. I might have to do some maths on that. They are 40 points apart, and yeah, it's going to be close. You know, right yeah. now he's tied for 16th with uh, with Nick Cunningham, three quarters of a second behind Holcomb. The exit of nine here. Most sleds have had a lot of problem here. Edwin keeps it pretty straight, drifting off to the right a little bit just before the entrance of curve 10. But here's where he gets that height very early. Holds it a little bit and then controls it out, out of curve 10, which is not a bad approach. Well, I think he needs more than 16th position here. He needs a top eight finish before the Dutch will let him go, whether he vaults Ivo de Bruyne or not. Oh, now then, Lucas Schnitzer with William Fulani, young driver coming into this Italian setup at the oh. end of this Olympic oh. cycle. And this is bringing the new blood in, isn't it, for the next four years and just getting them blooded before the games. Yeah, we talked about how Simone Bertazzo just uh, maybe a little bit past his prime as far as pushing goes. So you bring in a young kid and hope to have a future for the program as well. But again, already 43 hundredths of a second back. He's going to be battling to, to make the second run. Nice smooth drive, of course, two bob tracks in Italy. Cortina in the Dolomites and the Torino Olympic track. But both, unfortunately, are currently closed. The Italians, with two tracks on home ice, of home ice, can't train on either of them. That's close, he's at 20th position right now, coming down, he's almost a full second back. If he can hold 20th and hold off both Jackson and Verba, who are to come off the track after him, and he'll get a second run, but that's going to be really tough yeah. with uh, both Jackson and Verba. At the moment, the Italian is in, and Heath Spence of Australia will not get a second trip down the ice. Heath Spence and Ivo De Bruyne are bumped from the race. And this is the nitty-gritty of World Cup racing. Only the fast 20 go into the second heat. 
So it's go fast or go home. Here you can see he's coming through Kreisel, going through shadow, then light, shadow, then light. And that's got to be hard for some of these pilots to, to be able to really focus on the exit. Yeah, I said to Pierre Ludus, how do you know where the exit is? There's nothing, there's not the red rag hanging from the ceiling like in Altenburg. He said, oh, you use the four lights. I said, which one do you steer on? He said, if I told you that, I'll have to kill you. <laughs> Yeah, lots of information and plenty of secrets in this trade. John Jackson of Great Britain with Joel Fearon behind him. Jacko raced in two-man and four-man in Samaritz yesterday and today. And has come here now to top up more points, chasing fitness and positions. Only once this year so far, Jackson has got a second run, and that was when he had finished in 20th place. Here he has a start rank of 18th, so he's going to have to do some driving in order to keep his position inside the top 20. Well, in July, it looked as though his Olympic dreams were over when he tore his Achilles, but some very good surgery and recuperative work have got him back and training and into fitness, and the speed is starting to come. Of course, what you want is to never have an injury like that, but if you do, not in the summer before the Olympic Games. 20th place at the moment, off an 18th fastest start. Jacko needs a good exit and gets one. 101.2, this is hovering in the danger zone for John Jackson of Great Britain. Still 20th ahead of Schnitzer the Italian. But he needs at least one more place to be certain of a second run. He's in 20th spot right on the bubble. At the moment he is in. The check team is all over her still to come behind him. Yeah. So it's one sled is going to make the difference between Jackson uh, and, and another run. And those two are 20th and 21st in the World Cup rankings as well. They are very close together. And he has been pushing hard in Samaritz all week, racing in Samaritz this morning. You know, you talk about his Achilles being his problem there. You can see. You know, he might have full function or full range of motion right now, but, you know, taking a couple months off and, you know, having to recover and recuperate, you know, that's going to take away from a lot of your strength and speed. And uh, you just don't have a whole lot of time once the season starts to, to do great rehab. So for John just to be in this position right now, that's saying a lot about his character and determination. John. Pushing hard and hoping for a good result. Jan Verb of the Czech Republic with Michal Vacek behind him will also be looking to make the cut. And again on pace, should be in the top 20. Same as Jackson. Good load into the sled, a 5.15 start time, 13th best. That's not bad for them. Again, Jackson and his team should be quicker than that in the two-man. Were he healthy, 50.4, good momentum. At the moment, Verber is in the race. Uh, not great velocity. Went from 13th fastest at the start to 16th at the next split. So, you know, sometimes that's due to the track deteriorating a little bit, but for the most part, you'd have to blame that the driver just didn't have great lines or that the sled didn't have good velocity as the brake been loaded. 17 spot, he is slumping a little here. 101-2 for John Jackson, big skid for the Czechs. 101-2. Could be the difference right there. Oh, this is going to be very squeaky bum time for the Brits. 122 at the bottom, 20th place. Is he in or is he out? It's him or Jackson, and he's in. And Jackson is out by one-tenth of a second. John Jackson of Great Britain does not get a second heat. Well, 50 years ago in Eagles in Austria, Tony Nash and Robin Dixon won a two-man Olympic gold medal, given a bolt for the broken bolt in their sled by their arch rival, Eugenio Monti. 50 years later, John Jackson's two-man will not be in the race because Jan Verber edged him out for that last spot in the second heat. Yep, and that's, uh, this made it really close, the skid right here. He dropped from 17th position at that moment to 20th position when he crossed the finish line. So there, there was a loss of speed right there. He will have known what the pressure was. You can imagine the inner monologue there, can't you? It's probably audible from the back seat. But at the other end of the table, quarter of a second advantage from Steve Holcomb. Was it a nice advantage or was it the Stevens pushing Holcomb and Langton? Great start. And Kurt Tomasiewicz top draw drive absolutely had it all going on exactly you know this is exactly what the american program needed just a boost of confidence you know the last couple races haven't gone as well as we would have hoped you know finishing in seventh place and fifth place in winterberg and st moritz and two man but uh you know even if they they don't hold this number one position this confidence boost is going to be huge going into koenigsee next next week and sochi 
a couple of weeks after that. 2200s ahead, about hefty, quarter of a second and a little bit more covering the top four. And then still Melbardis and Kibas Manis could be in the medals. Cripps could medal from there. Maybe even Florsha's some really, really tight battles. This is going to be insanely close second heat. And this will be snakes and ladders. One move you're in the wrong place and you're sliding all the way down the order. One great effort and you could vault half a dozen places. We could see some malingerers in the leader's box for quite a while. Yep, we definitely talked about that. You can lose time on this track by with a mistake, but you can't drive perfect in game time. So stay with us for all the action in the second and deciding heats. This last hurrah to gain points for the Olympic Games, the penultimate race of the championship. Can Stephen Holcomb hold on? There's only one way to find out. Join Kurt Thomas and me, Martin Haven, for the second heat coming up from Eagles.